body with no head, 72 dead. Zainab said, Do not look at Ni'mal Mawla wa Ni'mal Nasir. A'udhu Billah min ash shaitan al la'een rajeem. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Wa salatuhu wa salam ala ashraf al-anbiya'i wal-mursaleen. Sayyidina wa maulana abil qasim Muhammad. Ma salala. وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين If everyone can settle down inshallah we can begin At the outset I want to ask a question so that <clears throat> based on this we can uh, see where the speech is going. The question is this, do you ever feel that when you pray and when you offer your prayers that your heart and mind are not in the proper place? Do you feel that when you're doing something good and when you're obeying Allah, practicing Islam, that you feel that uh, you're not growing. And that you feel there's ups and downs, mostly down <laughs> rather than up. If the answer to any of these questions is yes, then you might be interested in what we are going to say in the next three days in order that we see how to make ourselves grow spiritually and to develop our faith and our love for Allah and to complete our journey towards Allah in a more fruitful manner. Brothers and sisters, ignoring the realities that surround us, not paying attention to the realities that affect our lives is more harmful to our faith, is more detrimental to our faith than ignoring the instructions of religion. In other words, when we want to grow in our faith, when we want to become better, if we want to grow spiritually in our ru and our ruhaniyat and our marifat and our love for Allah, what we tend to do is that we try to look for things to do. We try to look for things that we should do or get the knowledge of things that we shouldn't do. And this is how we try to grow. But the fact is that spiritual growth doesn't come by doing things, by paying attention to things that we can do or we should do. Spiritual growth comes by looking at those things that we cannot do that we are unable to do, that are outside of our ability. Looking at our reality, looking at the reality that surrounds us, that dictates our life, that we don't have a control over. This is where you see that a person, if he wants spiritual growth, he needs to pay attention to those things. Those things that are our reality, that things that we don't and we are not able to do have much more effect on our faith and have much more influence in our growth 
than looking and paying attention to those things that we are able to do. A lot of times we see that you ask, we ask the wrong questions for the wrong things. We want to grow spiritually, so we ask the question to the Maulana saying, what can I do? What should I do? You see, when you ask these questions, you are asking regarding things that you are able to do. But that doesn't help us grow spiritually. That doesn't help us to get closer to Allah. That doesn't help us to get any nearer to our goal. What will help us is when we start paying attention to and focusing on things that we don't have choice in. That reality that dictates our life and it surrounds us. When we start looking at those things, then you see spiritual growth coming into us without any hesitation. It just comes. We start growing. Looking at reality, that's how we grow. And when we don't pay attention to reality, when we don't pay attention to those things that we are unable to do, then, and we only pay attention to things that we can do, then this practice is not only useless, but harmful. A person who doesn't look at his reality, and doesn't look at the reality that surrounds him, that binds him down, that dictates his life, when that person starts to pray, he can pray as much as he wants. This prayer will not only be useless for him, but will become detrimental to his growth. It will become harmful for his growth. That's why when we want to practice something, when we want to do something, at the same time we need to concentrate on those things that we cannot do. Now I explain that, now let me explain this more, so if you send me a salawat. When we look at our life, we see that there are many things that we are unable to do or we don't have a choice in. Just looking at a reality that's within us, our life. Just a moment of concentration on our life and my death is more useful for spiritual growth than praying for years. If a person doesn't look at his reality of life and death, as an example, if he doesn't look at it, if he doesn't concentrate on it, if he doesn't analyze it, if he doesn't try to pay attention to it, then he can pray as much as he wants. The prayer will be useless for him. It will become so redundant that you will get frustrated as to why it is not bearing fruits, why it doesn't have meaning. The reason it doesn't have meaning is because the meaning comes from looking at those things that you cannot do. In other words, what I'm saying is that those things that we don't have control over. There are things in our life that we don't have control over. And there are those things in our life that we have control over and we have choice in. That we can make a choice. But there are things that we don't have a choice in. People tend to ignore the things that they don't have a choice in and rather concentrate on things that they do have a choice in. That's why you ask in anything that you do, you ask, what can I do? Don't ask, what can I do in order to grow spiritually? Look at things and say, what I cannot do. And when you look at those things that you don't have control over, then you start recognizing. Just the matter, for example, if a person for a few minutes thinks about his death, just a few minutes, starts to just concentrate that I am going to die. Goes to a graveyard and sees a grave and says, one day I will be inside that grave. Do I have a choice in the matter? No. I don't have a choice in the matter. It's not in my control. This is something that's outside of my control. 
I can't choose. And hence, when you look at that just for a few minutes, you will see it will help you to grow a lot and influence your spiritual growth much more than if I want to go and pray for 20 years. 20 years you will pray, you will see that you still are feeling that I'm not achieving anything. It's becoming redundant. And all the rewards I hear that if you pray, this will happen. If you pray, this will happen. It's wajib and whatever it is, you see it's not bearing the fruits and hence becomes redundant and we don't get the fruits of it. Why not? Why, why is the meaning lost? It's because we're not looking at those realities that surround us that we don't have control over. Allah put faith... Allah put faith and the growth of faith and the growth of spirituality in those things that we do not have a control over. Not in those things that we do have a control in. That's where he put spiritual growth. You want to feel good? You want to feel closer to Allah? Then look at things that you cannot do in life, that are controlling your life. Look at those things. And then when you look at those things, you will see that, wow, who am I? Because the secret is this. Let me tell you the secret if you send a salawat. When we look at religion and the instructions of religion, wajibat, prayers, fasting, khums, hajj, zakat, ziyarat, whatever it is, right? People, you know, they go for hajj, they go for ziyarat. And of course, when you go there, you know, it's like uh, most people, what they get out of ziyarat is a time away from their ordinary life, where they are, outside of their normal life, no job, nothing, and hence you go somewhere. And you feel that you're getting something out of this, right? It's just a normal break. If you did get something out of it, it would show for the rest of your life. It will show for the rest of your life. But if you went and came back and are the same person, then maybe it was just an outing. Yes. Maybe it was just like, for example, we go to Hawaii. A week off from work, relaxation, peace of mind, away from everything that is stressful for us. And we go there and we feel good and we come back. You see, this feeling good is not what we're getting out of Hajj or Ziyarat. If that's all we are getting, it sheds off right away, it fades away. And most people, that's why, for example, nowadays it's becoming a fashion to go there, you know? Right? Instead of going to, you know, these places of vacations, you end up going for Ziyarat. And to treat Ziyarat like that, one, is really bad. You know, it is offensive for ziyarat itself. You go and make the ziyarat of Imam Hussein, it shouldn't be that when you come back, you're the same person, in fact, more frustrated. Salawat ala Muhammad wa And it becomes worse because you become frustrated. Hey, listen, I did all these things, still it's not helping me. It becomes frustrating, right? Why is it that I did all these things that I've been told to do by religion, and still, I feel that I haven't changed. I haven't become better. Why is it? Because really, if you go and meet the Imam and come back, you should be a different person. Right? Let's say, you know, just the fact that if you come to a majlis, right? And I'm giving a small example of majlis. It is our belief that in the majlis you see of anywhere of Imam Hussain that Hazrat Fatima also is present. <laughs> and the true uh, sponsor of the majlis is Imam Mahdi. So, when a husband leaves his wife and says, listen, I'm going to the majlis and coming back. So, what he's saying is that I'm going to go and meet my imam and come back. So, now when I go and come to a majlis, sitting with the imam, sitting in his presence, now I go back home, 
then the wife should at least notice some difference. Right? I mean, you just met the Imam and come back, you know. I mean, if you go to a shrink for an hour, you expect a difference, right? right? In your behavior, doesn't <laughs> matter what. We spent $500 on the shrink and still you're the same person. Right? So if you're going to the Imam and coming back, there should be a difference. But we see that if there is no difference, it means I didn't go to the Imam. I didn't go in the presence of the Imam, it should have changed me. Now obviously the Imam is there, but we are not there, right? We are not present. Right? That's why, you know, people, you know, they come to me and say, you know, or not, you know, I mean, you know, uh, the best time, you know, to look into your accounts of your life and accounting and bank balance and this and that is in time of the majlis. <laughs> Especially if the majlis is boring, so now this is the best time for me to now think about all the problems I have and solve them right there. Right? And then I say, Alhamdulillah, the majlis helped me so much. <laughs> really, isn't this the case? This happens. Now, why is it not happening? Why is this not helping us? My friends, here's the thing. The secret is this. When we pay attention to things that we can do, and that we should do, and things that are in our control, or things that we have a choice in, we are looking at things, really, we are paying attention, we are asking about things, or we are looking at our own power, our own ability. When a person starts looking at what I can do, this doesn't lead him to his reality. It leads him to a bubble in which he's thinking that I am in control. I am in charge. I do this. But when a person looks at reality, when a person looks at those things that dictate his life that he has no control over, then you know what happens? That leads him to understand that he is nothing. Really. Look at the things that we have no control over. When you start paying attention to that, you know what you understand from those things? Small things, things that you notice throughout the world, you notice in your life, small things. I am breathing. I am breathing. My heart is beating. Blood is being pumped. Do I have a control over it? Can I ask my heart to stop for a minute? I am born in a certain family. I had no control over that. Can I change it? Can't. Or for example, our own presence. If you take myself, what is my reality? I, when I look at the uh, aerial view of IEC, I'm a dot in IEC. IEC is a dot in Houston. Houston is a dot in America. America is a smudge on the world. <laughs> and the earth is a speck in the universe. Right? When you look at this, we, what do we end up understanding? That I am insignificant. I am irrelevant. When I start looking at reality, I am humbled. I am a nobody, really. I am small. That's what happens when you look at things that are not in your control. That you don't have any control over. Why? Because it humbles us. I have no control over this. That is where we find faith. And that's where we come to the realization that we are weak. That we are weak. When Allah says that خُلِقَ insana ضَعِيف That Allah made insan weak. This weakness is not a choice. When you read the ayat, Allah says this is your reality. This is not a choice you're making to become weak. It's not in your control. 
You are weak in your reality. When Allah says in the Quran, Ya yuhal insan, antumul fukara'u ilallah. That, oh people, you are indigent. You are in need of Allah. This need is not a choice. This need is not something that, you know, we should do, you know. You know let's become poor or, you know, let's become in need of Allah. We as Muslims must become in need of Allah. <laughs> no, it's not your choice. It is a reality that I am in need of Allah. Every moment I breathe, that breath is a constant blessing that Allah is keeping me alive. I am in need of Allah. If I stop, if my blood stops for a few minutes pumping, I would be non-existing or I would die. I am in need of Allah. You see this need, where does it come from, this realization that I am weak, that I am small, that I am in need? It comes by looking at our reality. That is our reality. That is our reality. But when we look at things that we do, when we look at things that we should do, then it makes us look at our power, our ability. And the more we look at that, the more we start becoming arrogant. See, it leads to arrogance. If you list out things that are in your control and not in your control, list them out. What's in my control and what's not in my control? What am I doing? What I can't do? Meaning, in other words, it is controlling me. List those things out and you'll see when you look at the list of things that you do not have a control over, it starts making you humble. It starts making you look at yourself as small. But when you start looking at the list that you have done, for example, some people in order to encourage kids to pray more or get more excited, they say, you know what, uh, write out all the prayers that you have made. You know, you know what will happen when you start doing that? When you see the list of the amount of prayers you made, you'll be like, ha, ah, subhanallah, if there's anyone entitled to Jannah, it has to be me. That's what people start to think. Wow, I did all of this. I helped so many people. I gave so much charity. Wow, subhanallah. Then I have to go to heaven, you know. There's no one else. Allah, you know I mean? This is it. I should retire now. <laughs> this is what you end up thinking. Why? You grow. You grow in arrogance when you start looking at things you have done or you can do. It makes you grow in arrogance. And arrogance, as Imam Ali says, is the worst sin. Salawat ala Muhammad. It is the worst sin and it makes us think that we are in control. That I am in control. When we look at a reality, then we realize more that I'm not in control. I am not in control. And this is what gives meaning to the things that we do in life. Whether it's prayer, fasting, or any other thing, the, it finds meaning when we look at things that we do not have control over. You know, movies that are satanic, movies that are satanic, or shaitani movies, are not movies that have violence in them, that are rated R, or something like that. Really, those movies are not shaitani. You know what movies are satanic? Satanic movies are those that give you the feeling that you are in charge. That you are in control. Yes, they make you believe that, hey, it's in my hand. I'm in control of things. I have the choice. I'm the master of my destiny. I'm it. And once a person starts thinking that, this is the first step of kufr. What is kufr? Kufr that Allah mentions in the Quran. What is that? To think that I am in charge. Allah is not in charge. I am the one in control. Allah is not the one in control. When a person starts to feel that way, that's when he starts to become a kafir. He starts to enter the, uh, he crosses the border of kufr. And I am in charge of this. You know how atheists, right? They, they don't like to ever think that anyone is controlling their life. 
They, because they feel that I'm the master of my decisions. I make those decisions. Now, do we have a choice in the things that we do? Yes, we do have a choice in the things. But I'll explain later, where are those choices? Really, if we don't understand where our choices are and what these choices are, we would be completely not achieving or getting the fruits of our deen, of our Islam. A person needs to understand where these choices are. Where does Allah give these choices? I'll explain that later, probably tomorrow. But just the fact that when a person looks at this and sees this, that I am the one in control, this is how the atheistic mind thinks. And they try to tell you that, do you really believe that, you know, someone is controlling your life? Or are you in charge? And then obviously this is hocus pocus and all these things. This is what happens. And so what happens is that when we understand that, listen, there are things that we don't control. We don't have a control and it's a reality. I don't have to be a Muslim to believe in that. I just have to be alive to believe in it. You just have to be alive to believe that there are certain things that are not in your control. You are not running them. Someone else is running them. Someone else is running them. And once you start noticing those things, that's where faith grows. You start to become spiritually strong. But when you start looking at your actions, you start becoming arrogant and start entering the world of kufr. Let me give an example so uh, the young ones here can also understand what I'm saying. Send us salawats. <laughs> Long, long time ago, in the time of Bani Israel, that is the people of Musa, Bani Israel, they used to be a monk, a monk, a worshipper, who used to worship God. And he worshipped God for 40 years. That's a long time. 40 years. He worshipped him constantly. Worshipped him and worshipped him. And after 40 years, he looked back at all the worship he has done and all the prayers he has done and came to the realization that, you know, I have made so many prayers that really, if there's anyone in this region, in this place, who's worthy of being rewarded by Allah and who's going to heaven, it has to be me. Really, no one else prayed 40 years. He is the only one and everyone knew him to be a worshipper. Everyone knew him to be ascetic. Everyone knew him to be so pious and he was. And for, after 40 years, this realization comes into his mind. Looking at what? Looking at what he has done and achieved. So after 40 years, he thinks um, entitled to heaven. And so one day while he's praying in the jungle, Whereas he used to be a monk and he used to go as a hermit and pray in the jungle away from everyone else, away from all distractions and everything. In the jungle he was praying and Allah dried up that region, took all the water away from that region. Now after he prayed, now he was looking for something to drink. He went around looking for water, looking for water, could not find water. Looked around, looked around, couldn't find water. You know, he just, you know, after a while, he started becoming thirsty. And all the search that he did, it was fruitless. No water. And now he was getting desperate. The thirst is really hurting him now, and he's becoming desperate. Until he comes to the point that he's becoming delirious, and he needs water. And all of a sudden, he sees a person walking by conveniently with a jug of water and a bowl in his hand. You know, he sees the guy walking by and he looks at him and says, Hey, would you please give me some water? I'm dying of thirst here. Help me out here. So the guy who had the water in his hand, 
He said, all right, I will, you want water, but there's a price for it. He said, I'll pay you whatever price you ask me, tell me. So the guy said, okay, uh, I'll give you a glass of water for half your worship. For half your worship. The guy's like, what? Half of my worship? You know how much that is? 20 years. That's 20 years. <laughs> it's highway robbery, you know. Look at this guy, 20 years, he said, no way. I said, all right, suit yourself. He started walking. And this person, the monk, was thirsty, so he said, you know, I, I can't find water anyway, so I need to follow this guy. And he looked at him, and really, he couldn't bear it. And he said, all right, all right, you know what? I'll make the trade. Give me the glass of water. He gave him the glass of water, and he said, half of your worship, right? He said, yes. Half of the worship, he sold it for a glass of water. He got some energy back. He says, you know what? I'm going to follow this guy and still look for water. Maybe I'll find water. So he went around looking for water again. Behind this guy, as this guy was walking, looking around, could not find water, and then reached the same state of thirstiness. He was so thirsty that he again went to this guy. This time, he didn't even ask him. He said, listen, Please take the rest of my worship and give me a glass of water. Take the rest of my worship and give me the glass of water. Said, All right, suit yourself. He gave him the water, took the rest of his worship. Now 40 years of worship, two glasses of water. 40 years of worship, two glasses of water. And now a voice came to him and told him, now tell me, Really, how much is your worship worth in front of my reality? How much is your worship worth? Two glasses of water to save your life. That's it. My friends, this is what happens. When we start looking at the things that we do, when we start looking at our prayers and our fastings, it only leads us to arrogance and it takes the meaning away from prayers. So the reason that we feel that our prayers are redundant is because we are looking at things that we can do. But if we start paying attention to things that are not in our control, to the realities that bind us and dictate our lives, that's where we find humility and that's where we see our faith starts growing. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. The truth is that there are many things that are not in our control, in our life, that are all around us, that we live in. So many things that we don't have no control over in our lives. And they dictate our lives, they turn our lives, they change the things in our life. And if we start noticing them, really if we start noticing them, then that notice is going to make us understand who we really are and who Allah is and our relationship with Allah. It will help us to realize that. There's a hadith from Imam Ali alayhi salatu wasalam. In which he says that I came to know Allah I came to know Allah by the breaking of my decisions. Every time I decided to do something and that never came to be, that decision never came to be, I understood that something is changing my decision and that's how I came to realize Allah. See this reality, my friends, and this is something that now we need to pay attention to. Just pay attention to this point. If we ever, and this is usually what happens with human beings, because they think that they can change things, that they dictate things, when a person lives his life like that, then the things that are not in his control overwhelm his life. And really, he is just confused. 
you will see your mind will be confused, completely overwhelmed. What is going on in my life? Because you think that you can change reality. You think that you have control. You think that I'm the one who's making the decision. I'm the one who's making my life. And the minute we start thinking that, that's when our mind becomes overwhelmed. Why? Because these Things that are not in our control start dictating our life and overwhelming our decisions to the extent that I don't know what's going on now. Completely confused, perplexed as to what is happening in my life. That's how you see people are so confused they cannot even make decisions. Why? Because they thought that they are the ones who decided. They don't see the things that are being decided for them. These things that we don't have a control over, in Islamic terms, they are called muqaddarat. They're called muqaddarat, or what we call takdir. Takdir or muqaddarat are things that Allah decides for us, that we have no choice in. Muqaddarat are those things that Allah controls. We do not control. We have no choice in the matter. These things are muqaddarat. And when a person starts paying attention to his taqdeer, to the muqaddarat in his life, to the things that Allah is deciding for in his life, that's where faith springs from. That's where when we start to grow in faith and our spiritual growth starts. By looking at our muqaddarat. Really. One night of the year is special for ibadat. And we see that everyone is interested in it. What is that night? Laylatul Qadr. Very good. Laylatul Qadr. You see that prayer is special there, right? Ibadah is special there. Duas are special there. Everyone is in here, in the masjid, making sure that they're here and doing their amal perfectly correct. Why? Because on that night, we are told to pay attention to your muqaddarat. Things that Allah is deciding for you. When you start paying attention to things that are Allah is deciding for you, that Allah is dictating for you, then you see that spiritualness comes into us. Because Allah, you're deciding things that I have no control over. That's where you find this special meaning in prayer. Every night could be Laylatul Qadr if we pay attention to these realities every day. If we start paying attention to these taqdeerat and muqaddarat every day of our life and start noticing them, then every night will be Laylatul Qadr for us because every night our prayers will be special. Every night, my friends. What is this Laylatul Qadr? Where does it get its name from? You know, we have Laylatul Qadr every year, right? Three times a year, three days we do the amal, right? Three days. You wonder why three days? When it's Laylatul Qadr, it should be one night. It changed into Layalil Qadr, <laughs> three nights, right? You mention why it's three nights? Why is it called Laylatul Qadr? Because really from here you start understanding things. Why does Allah call this night the night of Qadr? He said the night of power. Right, the night of power. Ever paid attention to that? Ever heard the reason why it's called the night of power? You see, my friends, on that night, our muqaddarat are being decided. Muqaddarat are what? The things that we do not control, the things that Allah is deciding for all of us as individuals, for each one of us as individuals, and for all of us as a society. You see, it's a grand plan that is being made. 
A grand plan that is being made. And what is that plan being made that Allah is saying, okay, you know, what are muqaddarat? We restrict muqaddarat in our understanding to risk. We say our risk is being decided. It's not just risk that's being decided. It's everything that is going to happen to you that year is being decided. Everything that will happen to you. What illnesses you're going to fall in. What diseases you're going to contract. What friends you're going to meet. What friends you're going to lose. Which relatives are, are you going to lose. Who's going to die. The interactions that we'll have, what businesses will start, what businesses will profit from, what businesses will lose from. Everything that is happening to us that is not in our control is being decided on Laylatul Qadr. All, everything. Who are you going to meet as a friend? Which sins are you going to stay away from are being decided on Laylatul Qadr. When you're making dua, you're not making dua for risk. Allah, you increase my risk, increase my risk, you know, and that's the dua that we're reading. No, you're actually doing what? You are asking Allah for everything that Allah is deciding for us and to make it useful for us and helpful for us. Allah, keep me away from sins. When you ask that dua on Laylatul Qadr, then Allah will make it such that you stay away from that sin. Even when you want to, Allah will make it such that will happen. And you won't know how it happened. You know, I, you know, for example, someone alone at home thinks of something wrong to do. And he decides to do it. He's on his way to do it. And then you know what happens? He just glances at the wall and sees, you know, the alam of Hazrat Abbas. He just sees that on the wall and all of a sudden he realizes that what he decided is wrong. My friends, he wanted to do wrong. And that alam or that uh, poster that's on the wall was given to him by someone who went for ziyarat in Karbala. He brought it back for him and he just put it up there. That putting it up there and that becoming an obstacle for him to do wrong is his as Allah's answer to his dua on Laylatul Qadr. This is what Laylatul Qadr is. Everything that we do is being decided on that night. Everything that is happening to us. That Allah is deciding for is happening that night. And as individual it happens. As an individual it happens to us. And then Allah decides for each and every one person who's living in this world. What's going to happen to him? What's going to happen to him? And he, these things coincide with each other. And they're all being planned. Nothing is coincidental. Nothing, nothing is accidental. There's nothing that's coincidental or oh, this happened by accident. There is no accident. There is no accident. Allah explains that in the Quran, right? Look in the story of Khidr. What is that all about? The story of Khidr and Musa is just explaining that there's nothing that's happening by accident. Everything is being planned. You see a freak accident in which your child died. Don't think it's an accident. It is a design plan. He kills a child, right? You see, oh, the child is killed. To the parents, it's a freak accident. And their sorrow and their you know, upset and grieving and all that. But Allah says, no, it isn't part of a plan. Don't think it's an accident. The hole in the boat, what was that? The fishermen whose boat that was, they're looking at that boat and saying, oh my goodness, there's a you know, hole in the boat. It's a part of a plan. So everything that's happening that we don't know the source of it, you know that it is a part of a plan. Allah doesn't lead anything to chance. So now, all of these things he puts together, plans for each one of us, and all of us as a society of human race, he puts it together. And then all the things that are happening to us, he makes a plan for it on Laylatul Qadr. 
And all that plan is completed by the morning. It's completed by morning. Now Allah puts the plan into action. He puts that grand plan into action and then in that plan He tells everyone that now try to change anything that Allah has put in effect. This whole plan is made for all of us and we go through the exact plan for the whole year. My friends, this planning for everyone and putting that plan into execution and making a challenge that no one can change Allah's plan, this is a show of Allah's power. This is a show of Allah's power. Then he says, now this is the plan. Finish. It's not going to change, no matter what you do. It cannot change. And we are like, wow, how did that happen? It goes about. This is how this works. Laylatul Qadr is that night in which Allah puts all of these muqaddarat are decided. Everything that is Allah decides for us is happening. Yes, we have a choice in matter. And on Laylatul Qadr we do have a choice. To change anything that is being written for our future. Because that's what's happening, right? Your next one year is written for you. Your past year is being closed down. You know, your past year is being closed down. That's why in Laylatul Qadr, when you do the amal, what are these amal for? Have you ever paid attention to what the amal are? The amal are for, one, asking forgiveness for the past year that is being closed down tonight, the accounts of which are closed down tonight, and asking for the future. In other words, Laylatul Qadr is the Islamic New Year. The Islamic New Year is not the first of Muharram. That's the Hijri calendar the Arabs had. The Islamic New Year is Laylatul Qadr when all accounts for the previous year are being closed down and the new year starts for everyone. This is why we are up all night on New Year's. The difference is that the rest of the world, for them, a new year is just fun and frolic. But for us, a new year is the time in which we seek forgiveness for the past year and seek the fruits of the next year. This is our new year, Laylatul Qadr. You can call it the fiscal new year. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala. And hence, my friends, muqaddarat, these are things that Allah decides for us. When a person starts thinking that he can change this reality, and there are ways of changing muqaddarat, which I will mention tomorrow. How do you change muqaddarat? How do you change things that Allah decided for you? Or what are the things, what are the things that determine these muqaddarat? What you're going to get? What will happen to you? On what basis is it decided? I will go into that tomorrow. Today, just this much for us to understand that when we start looking at muqaddarat, that's where our faith starts growing. Truly, that's when we start to believe and our prayers will have meaning when we look at those things. The minute we start thinking that we are in control, that I change my destiny, then we will make decisions that are harmful for ourselves. They are harmful for ourselves. Just to give you an example of this, right, as to how, in an example that Amir al Mu'mineen gave. <laughs> On his way back from the Battle of Safin, our Imam was. Uh, telling Malik Ashtar about the grief that he has regarding his soldiers and his Shias and his people and how they betrayed him and how they were bribed by Mavia and how they left and ran away. He was explaining these things to Malik Ashtar. You know, I mean, look at this what happened, look at this what happened, look at this what happened. Malik Ashtar 
said, you know, in explaining this, Malik Yasser said, Mawla, you know, um, you know, our people have been to two difficult wars. Right? They've been to two difficult wars and they're war weary. And they're tired, exhausted. Maybe they need a break. Maybe if you give them a bigger allowance and increase their stipend, they will feel better. They will feel better. In other words, do what Mahavya is doing, that you know, he gives his soldiers a little bit more and they're happy to fight for him. If you also raise their stipend and allowance, then they will be happy to fight with you. They'll be happier to fight with you. Then, you know, this is Malik Yashtar, his advice, and he was trying to give us two cents. Imam he said that, listen, as far as increasing their wages to what is more than what they deserve, that I cannot do. That is not possible. Meaning that I will not give them an unjust share more than what they deserve. They're getting what they deserve. All of them. And this is what Imam Ali was about, right? That's it. But now understand, the next thing that Imam Ali said is very interesting. And it really comes back and hits home the point that I'm making. The next thing Imam Ali said that, listen, what will happen in the war? What will happen all of these things? You know, because Maliki Ashtar was looking at the things that we can do. Increase their wages. Do this and do that. Maybe that will help. Imam Ali in reply to that, he said, listen, if Allah wills for us to be victorious, we will win. If Allah wills for us to lose, then we will lose. Understand this. Malik Yashtar is concentrating on things that he should do, that we should do or we can do. Imam Ali is saying, it doesn't matter what we can do or we should do. What really matters is what Allah has decided for us. What Allah has decided, that is what really matters. I can't do anything to change that. That is something Allah decided for us. That is what's going to happen. This is the reality, my friends. And if you just pay attention to that, and then we will go on from here, from tomorrow. You know, uh, many people left Muslim Ibn Aqil. Many people left Muslim Ibn Aqil for various reasons, for different reasons. Some people left Muslim Ibn Aqil, you know, for, you know, that... Because their wives said, hey, you know what? Don't fight with him. Right? Go away from them. Yes. Many wives came into the battlefield and said, listen, there are many other men here, you know. If I lose you, who's going to take care of me? So the husbands left. Children came and took their parents away, their fathers away. Dad, if you die, I'll become an orphan. Do you want me to become an orphan? Look at my eyes. And the dad was like, wow, subhanallah. You know, how can I let you become an orphan? He went, right? They left. People went for different reasons. But there's one group of people who left Muslim Ibn Aqil for a very interesting reason. One group of Shias. And these people were not afraid of death. These people were not afraid of shahadat or martyrdom. You know what they left him for? Imagine this and think about this. Reflect on this a little bit. They left Muslim Ibn Aqil because they said that if we fight with Muslim Ibn Aqil and die with him, then you know what? It won't be fruitful. Let us wait for Imam Hussain and fight along his side. Imam is coming here, Imam Hussain is coming here, let us fight with him. Let's not waste ourselves for him. If we fight with him, then who's going to help Hussain? Who's going to help Hussain? So they, I mean, just imagine this. Who, I mean, what is going on in their minds? What is going on in their minds? Really, look at this, my friends. It's so, such a thing to think about. 
Muslim Ibn Aqil is there, they're saying that if, if we fight with him, then maybe we'll die here and we know we're going to die. But who's going to help Hussein? In order to help Hussein, we will leave Muslim Ibn Aqil to die. You know, my friends, here's what happens. When Allah has decided something for you, He opens that door of opportunity and opens it in front of you for you to take that choice. If you don't take that choice that Allah is offering to you, then that choice will never come back to you again. That choice will never come back to you again. <clears throat> These people, they left Muslim. They said, we will not help you. You know, it's more important for us to help Imam Hussain. You are just the naib of the Imam. You are just the naib of the Imam. We will help our Imam when he comes. We will fight along his side to help him in his movement. Subhanallah. You know what? Allah never gave them that chance. Allah never gave them that chance. And the people, really, those who died with Muslim Ibn Aqil, those who took that opportunity and said, you know what? It is my job to stand with Muslim Ibn Aqil. If I have to die, I die because that is what Allah decided for me. Those people who did that, you see, even today, when we take the names of the Shahada of Karbala, their names are included with them. Look at Hani ibn Urwa. He didn't die in Karbala. He died alongside Muslim ibn Aqil. But when we take the names of the Shahada of Karbala, Allah put his name also alongside them. We are not the ones to decide, my friends. When Allah decided something for us, He gives us that window of opportunity to make a choice. If we do not make a choice, then it goes away. It goes away. Really. If, what kind of a choice did Allah give to the people who came to Karbala? I want you to imagine yourself standing in the battlefield of Karbala <coughs> being a spectator let's say you're not in the army of Yazid you're just a spectator and here you see that Imam Hussain is crying out on the top of his voice Hal min Nasir and Yansurna is there anyone who will help is there anyone who would defend the house of Rasulullah? And you're standing there and this opportunity, this window is opening for you that Allah is opening by, by this stance Imam Hussain took, by this voice that he raised, that this is your chance to attain eternal happiness. And you are standing there. Imagine if you would take that chance. And Alhamdulillah, you will take that chance. You will take that chance. You know, I mean, you all are different. You know, you all are the children of Karbala. You are the students of Karbala. And I have certainty that you will take that chance. And you will make that choice. Really something that we need to reflect upon but when you know a more difficult choice and a hard choice just the rendering of it is so hard for us to bear you know everyone had a choice to join the martyrs of Karbala in Karbala they had a choice and even after Karbala they had a choice to become one of the martyrs of Karbala, to become one of those who died with Imam Hussain. You know, all through the journey, people had a choice. Everywhere they became spectators of the ladies of Imam Hussain's household being dragged as captives in the streets of Kufa and Sham. Everyone who was watching that had a chance to come and defend the Haram of Rasulullah. 
Can you imagine? Everyone had that choice. Imagine that, that someone that you see the daughters of Rasulullah being taken as prisoners, dragged in the streets, and you are watching it, and you are seeing it. Can you imagine looking at that scene and saying that, let me do something to stop this. Let me do something to stop this from happening. You know, it, was, it is a difficult situation. How, I mean, for us, my friends, for us, those who have ghayrats, those who have honor, those who have a sense of shame can understand what Imam Zainul Abideen is going through. When Imam Zainul Abideen entered the court of Kufa in front of Ibn Ziyad, his head was bowed down. He was meek. He wasn't standing up brave and courageous. And people in the court noticed that. And they condemned him for it. Someone came to Imam Zainul Abideen afterwards. And he told him that, You are the Imam, I understand that. But something that is bothering me all the time is this. That when you came, when Muslim Ibn Aqil came to the court of Kufa in front of Ibn Ziyad, he came like a Hashimi lion. He was so tall and he was so strong and he spoke to Ibn Ziyad eye to eye. He would not bow down in front of him. He would raise his voice and he would speak to him and he would stand with him as Ibn Ziyad was standing. But Mawla, when I saw you, you being the Imam, you came there so cowardly. You came there with your head bowed down. You came there speaking so lowly and speaking so softly. I thought you would be stronger than him. What happened? Why were you like this? Why are you like this? Imam Sajjad just imagined himself in that court again. And that made his tears come out from his eyes and drench his beard. And he said, you have done injustice with me. You made a wrong comment on me and a judgment on me. Let me tell you, when Muslim Ibn Aqil came, no one was, no one was beside him. But one came to the court of Ibn Ziyad. Then my mothers and sisters, they were behind me and beside me. I was trying to hide them from the people. That's why I did not attract any attention. <laughs> Imagine in that state, how Imam Sajjad is feeling. Imam, what he's feeling. And this is where you see, when the ladies came to Kufa, you know, really, if you, if you go into another city and you have to go through shame and indignation, in another city that no one knows you, maybe you can bear it because no one knows who you are, no one has a relationship with you. But this, this is the city of Kufa, where Imam Ali used to rule, he was the leader, and Zainab was the princess of Kufa. People knew Zainab, ladies knew Zainab, so that when Zainab was being dragged in Kufa, Imagine the shame and indignation that Ahlul Bayt had to go through, that Zainab had to go through. And then you see how, how these people, not only were they laughing and ridiculing, but they were throwing stones. They were throwing stones at the ladies. They were throwing things at them, hitting them with them. And the ladies would cover Zainab. They would be trying to cover their heads to make sure that they don't get hit. Just one story I'll mention to you. One story I'll mention to you so that you can truly feel. You can feel for other Zainab. You can feel for Fatima. After the ordeal was over, when Zainab went back to Medina, and the caravan went back to Medina. In Medina, one day when Zainab was, as was her habit, she would go to the grave of her mother. And she would just cry there. And she would just remember the martyrs, remember the ordeal that she had to go through. And she would cry there. And she would shed her tears there. So one day she fell asleep. 
she fell asleep at the grave and in that sleep it is said that she had a dream and in her dream her mother Fatima came to Zainab for the first time she saw her after the ordeal the first time that she saw her mother she said mother is that you mother is that you mother mother you came too late Mother, your house is ruined. Mother, your son Hussein has been slaughtered. Mother, where were you, mother, when this was going on? Mother, I miss you so much. I miss you so much. Where were you? When we were being dragged through Kufa, mother, I was remembering you. Mother, Hussein's head was in front of me. Every time I looked at him, I would think of you. Mother, everywhere we went, we were being laughed at. People threw stones at us. Our hands were tied in ropes. Mother, where were you, mother? Through this journey, we, I miss you, mother. She started complaining to Fatima. Fatima did not say anything in the dream. She cried in front of Zainab and said, Zainab, after Zainab was finished, Miss Fatima said, Zainab, don't blame me, Zainab. First, listen to my side, Zainab. Listen to my side, Zainab. Mehnab, you know that before you came to Karbala, I reached Karbala. <laughs> Zainab, you were in the tents and I was sweeping the place. Hussein would be slaughtered. I was dusting that place. Zainab, you saw the body of Ali Akbar come into the tents and you cried over him. Zainab, I saw Ali Akbar being speared by a spear in his heart. I saw it with my own eyes. Zainab, you felt sad by looking at Hussein from far away and he was slaughtered and the sword of the killer was on his neck. You saw him from the hill. Zainab, I was ill. Hussein was in my lap when he was being slaughtered. It was me who was holding his head and comforting him. I was comforting him. Zainab, you, when you left there, when you left, I walked along. I walked along with the caravan, Zainab. You were on the camels when you saw those children who were clinging to their mothers fall from the camels and up. I was going to each and every one of them and crying over them, Zainab. Zainab, don't blame me, Zainab. Don't say that. I was always with you, Zainab. I was always with you. When you said you were in Kufa and people were throwing stones at you, Zainab, you know what I was doing? I was looking for the stones that are coming towards you and I will take them on myself. Allah give us a talking and a blessing to be on the right path. Allah give us the wisdom to understand your guidance. Allah increase the love of Ahlul Bayt in our hearts and the hearts of our children. Make our feet on the path of Islam. Strengthen our arms to hold up the flag of Islam. Hasten the reappearance of our Imam and make us his helper when he comes. Wa akhirat da'wan, alhamdulillah, rabbil alameen, matameh hussain.